nice to be together again let's pray together father we thank you for this hour thank you for this moment thank you for your faithful people we're asking lord that you reward our faithfulness in jesus name bless the works of our hands bless our ministries bless our ministration grant us wisdom grant us insight Grant us greater love for souls. Amen. And Lord, we pray as we speak to them in the wisdom of the Lord. Many will be turned to the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with every one of us tonight. Amen. And all our brethren in all the places where we're gathering together to receive this message in fellowship together. Pour your blessings upon everyone. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to John chapter 4. And from John chapter 4, we're looking at Christ. We're looking at the woman of Samaria, Samaritan woman. And we're looking at the conversation that took place between Christ and this woman. And what we learn from the whole story. John chapter 4, reading from verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus says unto her, give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then says the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. That's what we are looking at today. And we are titling our message tonight, Training to Become a Committed, Effective Soul Winner. Training to Become a committed, effective soul winner. You will see that Jesus Christ led this woman out of the darkness of ignorance and led her into the truth of salvation, eternal life. And as you look at the story, and you look at the thing that transpired between her and the Savior, you, have, you wonder what is what is soul winner Jesus was. He was the model in soul winning. He said, learn of me. And because he said, learn of me, that's why we're looking at this passage. And we're looking at the way he dealt with this woman to bring this woman out of herself into the redemption of the Lord. Look at this. The woman was a total stranger. You've never met somebody, and you want to start a conversation. You want to lead the person to the Lord. How do you do that? Not only that, she was tribalistic. And you can tell, as she was saying, what are you going to draw with? Our fathers did this and this. Are you greater than uh, Jacob? Tribalistic. And then she was a known sinner. She wasn't a private sinner, a secret sinner. Open, flagrant. You can tell from the story of her life. And yet she was a religious devotee. There are people that are devoted to religion. And whatever you try to bring up, they bring another aspect of religion. And then you answer that they bring another aspect of religion. She was an isolated neighbor. You see, the time she came, we'll look at that as we move on. She came in the afternoon, she came alone. Because of her notorious life, she will not come when all the other women in the village, in the community, when they came to the well. And she was a poor, common lady. Just ordinary. 
just like you know everybody else in the community and yet jesus christ was ready for her in fact we're told that jesus must needs go through samaria it was a deliberate thing jesus was seated in the right place at the right time and he was purposeful saying the right thing at the right time even though he was weary he spoke first as we look at the conversation between Christ and this woman, that woman would not have spoken first. That woman would not have initiated or started any conversation at all because she said, we don't talk together. We don't relate together. We teach that you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and you're asking me for a drink of water. And he began naturally. There's no religious connotation here. Give me some water to drink. She used what the woman was familiar with. She came to draw water. And everybody needs to drink water. And Jesus was actually thirsty and weary. And so it was a natural scene. Give me water to drink. Do you see that she, he did not introduce himself? There are many people that stand in the bus. And before they say anything at all, they say, I am so-and-so, and I'm coming from such and such a place. Let me ask you, if you were, let's say, you're a religious person yourself, but you belong to a particular historic church, and somebody stands up in the bus and he says, everybody listen, I am a Jehovah's Witness, I want to talk to you. Immediately they mention that, you tune off. Because you know that that's not my area. I don't want to go that direction. And the introductions we make sometimes can put people up. You see, it can come in from a good place. They don't know that. I belong to a good church. They don't know that. I have the right message. They don't know that. And Jesus did not say, hey, woman, welcome. Can I talk to you? I am the Messiah. Uh -uh. You are the Messiah. What a wonderful and then you are the Messiah, you are sitting down here. How is it you are the Messiah? We never heard about that. And he should have told us from Jerusalem that the Messiah had appeared. He didn't make that introduction. And he didn't say, I am a prophet. You are a prophet. The way you dress, I don't see the prophet, uh, you know, ministry or minister in you. There was no introduction. She, she just started, give me water to drink. And then he led her in a very quiet way from corruption to conversion. And yet it was uh, natural from corruption to conversion. Number one, conversation. Conversation. He started with a conversation. Number two, there was conviction. As they went on in the discussion, from that conversation, conviction came. Number three, as the conviction came on high eventually, there was a confession. Go call your husband. She, the Lord Jesus did not use any negative word and any cutting word, any piercing word as to the kind of life you are living. Just go and call your husband. And the conviction led to confession. And then from that confession, you can see there's a comprehension. After Jesus Christ said, yes, you've told the truth. Because actually, you've been with five men, and the one you are staying with now is not your husband. Comprehension came. I perceive. I understand. I know. I am face to face with a prophet. And then after that, you'll find that there was conversion. Because she left her water pot and ran into the city and said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Now I've been there. Can't you see that this is the Christ? There was consecration. Because now all she wanted to do is not to draw water. All she wanted to do is not to labor for herself. All she wanted to do was just to proclaim Christ, proclaim Christ, and then to bring the people unto Christ. 
consecration. And then you find there was continuation. Continuation because she didn't just stop there. As the Samaritans came, they even told Jesus to stay with them. And she was there and all the other people were there until two days after they said, how do we know she was there? Because they told her. They said, it's not only because of your word that we believe. We have heard him ourselves. And we know that this is the savior not only of samaria this is the savior not only of israel this is the savior of the world what a wonderful thing and if jesus could lead this woman like that you can and you will and that same wisdom will come to you in jesus name jesus has given us the perfect example of a model soul winner. Therefore, we're looking at the message, training to become a committed, effective soul winner. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the instructive conversation of the compassionate soul winner. The instructive conversation of the compassionate soul winner. Jesus Christ was a compassionate soul winner. And you can see the instruction that we're getting from uh, the conversation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the imperative confession of a convicted sinner. Imperative confession. A point has to come when a confession will be made. It's imperative because without that confession, what does the Bible say? If we cover our sins, there'll be no mercy. But if we confess and forsake, we'll have mercy and pardon and salvation. Number three, the immediate commitment. You see this woman, between her conversion and the consecration, there was no gap. Immediate, immediate, immediate commitment of a converted soul. The immediate uh, commitment of a converted soul. We're coming to number one. Tell me your number one. The instructive conversation of the compassionate soul winner. What we're going to do, we're going to run through this story. And as we look at the story, then you begin to get some wisdom. The Lord will make you wise. And the wisdom of a good, effective soul winner, the Lord will grant to you, to me, to all of us in Jesus' name. We're looking at John chapter 4. John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus was tired. Jesus was weary. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was thirsty. And being wearied because of the journey, because of the activities previous to this time, he was weary. And yet he spoke. You see, there are people, if they're weary, they don't do anything. If they are tired, they don't do anything. If they are jobless, they don't do anything. If they are hungry, they don't do anything. If they are sad, they don't do anything. But Jesus Christ is showing us the example that even when you are weary, even when you are tired, yet you can speak and speak a word for the Lord. We're looking at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 10. Weariness is no excuse. Tiredness is no excuse. Joblessness is no excuse. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 10. He arose and he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand claimed to the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. And so from the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was weary, but he spoke out. He was weary. He started the conversation. He was weary, and yet he led this soul and won this soul to Christ. We're coming to John chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. 
the Jewish people calculated their hours of the day from the morning, six from six o'clock in the morning. The third hour of the day will mean uh, what time? 9 a.m. The sixth hour of the day will mean what time? 12 noon, 12 noon. Now you understand, 12 noon. There's another man that came to Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 3 verse 1. John chapter 3 verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus when? By night. That was all right, a man to a man. Jesus Christ and Nicodemus were men. And so to come by night, we can converse, we can discuss. But this woman, if it had been by night, Jesus alone and the woman alone, and then they holding a conversation, and the woman is not allowed to even drop her water pot into the well and take the water, and Jesus engaging her in conversation, all alone by themselves in the night. That will not be wise. That will not be all right. And so we must know what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. If it's in the afternoon, in the open, not in a secret place, not under closed doors, not behind any curtain, and then the man is talking to the woman, and it's not that they're so close that people are wondering what's going on there. That's wisdom. And so we need to learn from the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking at uh, John chapter 4. We're looking at verse 7. John chapter 4, verse 7. They commit the woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus says unto her, tell me, give me to drink give me to drink there are many people that will you know tell you that that is jesus he had that wisdom he had that understanding and so i can never have an understanding like that you know give me water to drink that's not a strange thing you know? that's not something that is totally new but looking at first kings chapter 17 first kings chapter 17 and here we're reading from verse 10 we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 10. It says, and, uh, and he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And uh, he called unto her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel. Tell me. That I may drink. The same thing, the same thing. A prophet had said that before. A prophet had done that before. You see, we build on the foundation of other people. What they had already done, what they had already said, Jesus saying the same thing, give me water to drink. Uh, we, we can talk about the condescension of Jesus, the humility of Jesus, because through him all things were created. Without him was nothing made that was made. And he, the master of the sea, and the master of the ocean, and the possessor of all things, all things were made for him, and yet he didn't have a glass of water to drink. Because he emptied himself of all this power, he emptied himself of all this glory, and now he's asking this woman for a drink. You understand? People feel honored when you ask them for a helping hand. People feel exalted when you ask them, can you do this for me? Can you show me the way to get to this particular street? I'm a, I'm a total stranger around here, and I want to go to such and such a place. I know I can take this way, but I'm looking for a shorter route. Or maybe, do you know when the train leaves around here? Do you know if the buses are not here, if they have their timing? Or do you know whether, you know, they sell? I want to buy something from the market and I know there are different kinds of markets uh, can I get tomato here can I get this one here you are asking them for a helping hand the average person even if he does not know will say I don't know and if he knows the person will say if you go this way and go this way uh, that you'll get there then you might say thank you very much I really what will I be without knowing the way and then you understand uh, you also may want to get somewhere now you don't know the way I know the way anywhere I want to go I know the way to get there I can tell you something 
I know a place you ought to go and you don't know the way there. You've never met me before. And then you are telling me I have a place to go. I don't know the way there. There is a city. I know that if you know about the city, you would like to get there. Which city do I want to go to? Because I've gone to, do you know where I've traveled to? You are making a conversation. And from that conversation, you are lifting them away from the natural to the spiritual. God will give you wisdom. The point is, when you ask people questions, that when you ask them for a helping hand, they might oblige you, or they might uh, start a conversation, or they might argue, they might reject or resist, but that leads you further and further and further. And then you talk about the city in heaven, and then you talk about the way to get there, and before you know what, you are leading a soul to the Lord in Jesus' name. And then we're coming to chapter 4 of John, and I'm reading from verse 9. Chapter 4, verse 9. Then said the word, Woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh of us, get drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, there are people that will, you know, just jump in there and say, There you are, you're tribalistic. Do you know that being tribalistic? Being tribalistic is a sin. Do you know that you are carrying over the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans for many, many years? And you didn't know how that kind of hatred started? And do you know the Bible says if you have hatred in your heart against another person, you didn't even know me, and I'm asking you for something, and then you are bringing the age-old hatred. Nothing like that at all. We must have the wisdom. Once you accuse them, once you confront them like that, you are antagonize them and whatever you are going to say after they're not going to listen so in the conversation in leading people to Christ and leading people to their redemption and salvation there'll be no antagonism there'll be no opposition there'll be no accusation there'll be no confrontation look at what Jesus said in verse 10 Jesus answered and said if thou knewest the gift of God you know the thing that it didn't even answer the question at all. You know, sometimes, I look up here, brothers and sisters, uh, there are some questions that if you know that this question is not going to profit the person you are talking to, and the answer is not going to yield any good result, why are you going to answer it directly? And we always do that at the time of, uh, you know, on Sunday, Sunday scripture, somebody is uh, posing a question, the person might be ignorant, the person might be sincere, the person might be antagonistic, the person might have a reason why I, I've got my chance now. I'm going to ask this question and this will just destabilize uh, this uh, man standing in here. Now tell me about this and this. You don't have to answer directly. If you know that the thing is going to generate a conflict and it's going to generate anger and it's going to generate another opposition and conflict from the man, another debate, we're not uh, debating, we're leading people to life eternal. God will give you wisdom. And in a gentle way, in a Christ-like way, you answer that question and then you move on. And so Jesus said, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says unto thee, give me to drink, thou would have as, as asked him of him, and he would have given thee living water. He said, you know, so, and then you are going to reap. Give me water, and then if you knew what I had that I could give you, you will not be talking the way you are talking. What's that? It's kind of stimulating her interest. Is kind of diverting her from the religious argument and coming to the area of, I need this, I want this. If you knew what I had, if you knew what I could give you, you would have asked of me, and there will be no discrimination. I wouldn't say you are a Samaritan, and I would have given you. And then you see from that answer, we lead people in the way they will understand and in the way they will want more. Now you understand, the approach of Jesus Christ to Nicodemus was totally different. In the case of Nicodemus, look at the new vocabulary that Jesus used. Ye must be born again. Born again? 
How can a man be born again? When he's as old as I am, will I go back to my mother? So very, very I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's totally different because he was talking to a ruler of, in, of the Jews in Israel. And then Nicodemus said, how can these things be? You're telling me something that looks impossible. Ah, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he went to the scriptures. Why? Because Nicodemus was from the Sanhedrin. He was a ruler of the Jews. And he knew that story. He looked at people and he dealt with people and he used the scriptures that they knew. But look at this woman. We're not talking about, you know, somebody who is coming from, you know, the synagogue, talking, coming from a temple or reading the Old Testament and going deep into scriptures and then theological, you know, explanation. Nothing like that. Just the water of life. Just living waters. And thank God you'll have more of it in Jesus' name. And so, look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 33. Mark chapter 4, verse 33. It says in verse 33, And with many such parables speak he the word unto them. Tell me the final thing there. As they were able to hear it. As they were able to hear it. So Jesus did not talk over people's shoulders. Jesus did not talk away from their level of understanding is as they were able to be able. Let, let's come to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 4, verse 11. The woman saith unto her, Sir, now understand the trend of the conversation. Everything is built around one subject. You see, there are people... When they are trying to win souls to the Lord, they will approach it from seven angles. They will approach it from many, many angles that the person they are talking to does not really know what's our goal, what's the target. What topic are we dealing with here? You spoke about this, you spoke about this, you spoke about that. Jesus kept on the same subject, but every time bringing a little more and a little more, and a little more, until the woman could understand what Jesus was talking about. Look at verse 11, and the woman says unto him, Sir, can you see now, there's a, maybe you've not seen a change here, there's a little kind of change. There's respect now, because how is it to a Jew? And then you are talking to me. Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Well, the response of Jesus and the attitude of Jesus, the woman now said, Sir, there's some respect here. Thou hast nothing uh, to draw with. And the well is, uh, and the well is deep. From whence then uh, hast thou this living water? Are thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well and drank thereof religious pride himself and his children and his cattle. Now, this question, art thou greater than Jacob? What's the answer? Was Jesus greater than Jacob? Was Jesus greater than Abraham? Greater than Solomon? Greater than Jonah? Than everybody. And he told the Pharisees, he said, it's greater. You're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Before Abraham was, I am greater than Abraham. And yet this woman asking the question, art thou greater than Jacob? Jesus did not give an answer to that. You see, it is not everything you know, you will say. When you are trying to win a soul, you are not winning an argument. You are not winning an award. You are not winning a contest. You want to win a soul. And the soul is delicate. And the soul could become fanatically religious. The fellow could become antagonistic. And if you say something like, yes... Asking me, am I greater than Jacob? Of course, of course, I am greater than Jacob. 
And he only knew this fellow, this person now, as an ordinary Jew. She will count that as blasphemy. And then she will tune up. She will say, no, although I'm not a perfect person, but I don't want to add blasphemy to my sin. So look at what Jesus did when he said, I doubt greater than Jacob, verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, tell me, where is Jacob? I said, where is Jacob in the answer? No, Jacob is not here. That's, that's not the point. Jesus was not interested in going to religious history. And so Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, tell me, shall never thirst shall never thirst and but the water that i shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life can you see the development of the theme from water give me water to drink unto living water that's a that's a kind of a, a higher thing there if you drink this, you'll thirst again. The water I'm talking about, will, you will not thirst anymore. You'll never thirst. And then, look at verse 15. The woman says unto him, Sir, she had not lost the respect because Jesus sustained that line and string of honor. When you're talking to somebody, you, with, with the knowledge and with the experience and with the wisdom, you sustain the honor and you sustain the respect. So, Because if they don't accept you, if they don't respect you, if they don't honor you, they will not accept what you are saying. If they evaluate you as somebody who is unintelligent and who cannot communicate with them, and you don't know the human nature and the things they decide they want, they will not sustain the respect. The respect is necessary, and it is not a false thing. It just, it just came naturally. It says, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come thither to draw. She, she misunderstood. She thought it was a physical thing, natural thing, that I'm even, I'm tired of coming here every time. Come here, look at it, it's noon. Look at it, the sun is hot. And look at it, I'm coming here, and it's the distance from my house to get here. I do this every day. Give me this water. Well, Jesus was making a point. Because Jesus was a kind of lifting up her desire, her hope, her expectation. That's what you need to do. As you talk to people, you are helping them to have hope. There's a better life. There's a higher life. There's a desirable situation or state where you can find yourself. And so she said, give me this water. Jesus says unto her, tell me, go call thy husband and come hither. And you will see, the conversation is moving a little bit closer. Now personal life is coming in without accusation, without any bad language and without any corrosive word, acidic word. You know some people they have a kind of word uh, if they see somebody who is a public woman, if they see somebody uh, who is uh, like uh, not living right they want to show that person you are not living right, you are a bad woman, you are a defiled woman, you are this and that, not Jesus. Why don't we learn from Jesus gentle, lowly humble, sweet Go call thy husband and come see them. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Now she could have said another, but you know now Jesus had captured her mind. And Jesus has sustained that conversation. So she said, I have no husband. Jesus says unto her, thou hast said well. Thou hast well said commendation. There are some people that will tell us there's nothing good in a sinner. So if you appreciate a sinner, you're deceiving them. 
If you praise a sinner, you are the same. You will have a wrong notion of say, okay, I'm doing well. Have you not studied Jesus Christ? Somebody ran to him and said, uh, Master, what good master, what shall I do to have eternal life? And after he had corrected the language, then he said, you know the Lord, do this, do this, don't do it. He said, I've done this from all my youth. What like I yet? And the Bible says, and Jesus looking at him, loved him and said, one thing, thou lackest. Yes, he loved people. He appreciated people. And so Jesus said, thou was well said, I have no husband. Why am I telling you that you have said well? Look at verse 18. For thou hast heard, how many husbands? Five husbands. But, and he, whom thou, uh, whom thou now hast, is not thy husband, in that thou saidst, Thou truly. And so you will see here, as Jesus uh, said this, conviction was now coming. Comprehension was now coming. Already you see that a confession had been made. And Jesus was not going to stop there. Look at this. And the woman says unto him, Sir, you know how many times he's saying, Sir, now, in addressing Jesus Christ, respect and honor, Sir, I perceive, tell me, that a prophet. I thought you were just an ordinary Jew. I perceive thou art a prophet. Why did she perceive you are a prophet? Because Jesus said, you have had five husbands, and they have never met before. That's the gift of the word of knowledge. And then, uh, the person you are staying with now, that's not even, you didn't even go through any kind of ceremony. No husband. And then, uh, the woman said, you're a prophet. And since I know you're a prophet now, you know, there's a question that has been bothering my mind. I would wanted to meet somebody that will give me an answer to this question. Verse 20, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, tell me, woman. Now, you remember when Jesus called her mother, woman, still respect, still respect, did not say sinner, did not say profligate, did not say a bad word, just woman, woman. Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, look at this, if you look at the Old Testament, just a few times, God was called the Father. Now, now calling God the Father was um, a kind of peculiar revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, my Father which saved me, and then he said, my father, your father. And when he prayed, say, our father, which art in heaven. It was a new covenant revelation. But now he's bringing that in naturally. Just bringing in uh, the knowledge of things eternal, things spiritual, without forcing any issue at all. And he just said, in verse 23, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, as the woman got that answer, then she said, Well, I still have other things. But you know, I'm not going to ask you now. We are waiting for that D-Day. When the Messiah will come. And when that Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. You know, have you heard about that? That the Messiah, the Messiah, he knows all things. The Messiah will answer all questions. The Messiah will fulfill all your desires. The Messiah will give us all the hope we ever thought about. Whether you're a Jew or you're a Samaritan, the Messiah is coming. Look at verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know, I know, I know that Messiah's coming, which is called the Christ. When he is calm, tell me, he will tell us all things. 
look up here. Jesus could have said, ah, so you are waiting for the Messiah and you are living like this. You are waiting for the Messiah. So you knew about the Messiah and you knew that Christ is coming, the anointed one, that the Redeemer is coming and you, you're living like this and you want him to meet you in this condition. No accusation. If we're led by the Spirit of God in the conversation, and you're not, you're not interested in making her unnecessarily sorrowful, you're not uh, trampling on her, you're not pushing her down, you're not ill-treating her, you're not there to oppress her, you are there to save her, and you are there for her to understand Jesus Christ can save me. That's why you are there. Look at what Jesus said, verse 26. Jesus says unto her, tell me, I that speak unto thee, I am he. Did she accept that? Did she believe that? Did she receive the Messiah? Look at verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and says unto the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Already we've seen here how Jesus dealt with this woman. This is not ordinary wisdom. This is not learned theological wisdom. This is wisdom from on high, spirit-given wisdom. And it came from Christ, and as we come to him, he will give us that same wisdom. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 20. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 20. For it is not ye that speak. But the spirit of your father. Which speaketh in you. Claim that promise. The spirit of God will come upon you mightily. And will grant you heavenly wisdom. In Jesus name. Amen. Point number two now, uh, the imperative confession of a convicted sinner. The imperative confession of a convicted sinner. We're coming to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 15 through to verse 19. John chapter 4 from verse 15. The woman says unto us, sir, Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus says unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that thou sayest truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now we talk about confession. You see, when we talk about confession, it is a genuine confession. That is faithful confession with faith in Christ that leads to salvation. There is false confession. False confession. Do you remember um, this uh, man, Balaam, was leaving his house. He was going to Balaam. And God sent an angel. And then that angel confronted him and said, your way is perverse before me. Why did you strike that ass? If it were not for that ass, I would have killed you and spared the ass. Oh, he said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And he said, I have sinned. Then he said, but if you don't want me to go, then I will go back. That's false confession. The confession was not real. Because the angel already said, your way is perverse before the Lord. And then he himself said, I have sinned, but it wasn't real. Number two, there's forced confession. Forced confession. The, one, the first one is false. The second one is false. This one, Achan, 
are taking what he should not have taken. Because of that, 36 people in Israel had died. And then Joshua now, and he didn't uh, confess, and God said there's an accursed thing uh, in, the, in the place. And uh, because of that uh, accursed thing, uh, I cannot go with you, I cannot go give you victory. And they can't keep quiet. And then they started from tribe to tribe to tribe, trying to investigate who did this sin, and Achan kept quiet. And then they came to the family. Eventually, they picked on Achan. And Joshua said, tell me, what have you done? Confess it. Make your confession. Don't hide anything from me. And he said, actually, when I saw a goodly Babylonian garment, and then I coveted, and I took. That kind of confession is forced. It, it was forced into it. Forced confession. Then there's faint com confession. That is hypocritical confession, superficial confession, only the word of mouth confession, not deep in the heart. That one too does not have any forgiveness from the Lord. There is frivolous confession. Frivolous confession. Lord, I'm a sinner. Because nobody can say it's not a sinner. When I walk about, I don't know how many ants I have uh, stepped on. As I walk about, I don't know how many uh, cockroaches I have killed. As I walk about, that's frivolous, frivolous. Because those are not the things that God mentioned in the Bible as sin. They leave the real issue, and then they are talking about, uh, you know, what they have done. Then there is also faceless confession. Faceless confession. Lord... We're all sinners, my grandfather, my father, my mother, all our people in our village, we're wicked, we're, 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 and there's nothing that is real, that the man is saying, I know I am a sinner, and I know it so deeply, and I confess what I've done. You see this woman, there was nothing false with this woman. The woman just said, I have no husband, and Jesus said, yes, you have told the truth, because this is what had been before. And then there's formal confession. Every Sunday, those who do that, they go to the church and then they kneel down. There's a particular moment at the time of the service when they repeat after the priest, we have done what we shouldn't have done, we have not done what we should have done. So Lord, forgive us. We'll come back the following Sunday again and when we come to that particular time in the service, we have not done what we should have done, we have done what we shouldn't have done. God forgive us. And then we're coming next Sunday. It's formal. It's formal. And all that does not have recognition in heaven. But this one is real. This one is definite. We're not talking about the Pharisee. We're not talking about the Sadducee. We're not talking about our neighbors. We're talking about ourselves and the woman at salvation. And the people we talk to, when they can be definite and when they can be real and they are faithful in their confession, I believe the Lord will grant them eternal life in Jesus name and forgiveness is not an approval or permission to go on sinning that Jesus said you have said the right thing but already he told her the person you are staying with now is not your husband because whenever Jesus gave conversion it is to go and sin no more let's look at John chapter 8 John chapter 8 and I'm reading here from verse 11. John chapter 8. We're reading from verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. That is, uh, where are those who accuse us? And she said, no man, Lord, has condemned her. Jesus saith unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Tell me the rest. But go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. When grace comes into our lives, that's what it does for us. Go and sin no more. Chapter 5, John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. John chapter 5, we're looking at verse 14. After what Jesus findeth him in the temple and says unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more lest a worse thing come on thee. That's the result of the grace of God. Sin no more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're reading from verse 34. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, 
awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and sin not. We're coming to Psalm 4, verse 4. Psalm 4, and we're reading from verse 4. Grace turns us away from sin. Grace changes our lives. We're looking at Psalm 4, verse 4. It says, stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Sin no more. We're looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2. Reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live how? soberly, righteously, godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how many iniquity? All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of bad works sinful works zealous of good works and so we understand that confession the confession of sin if it is real if it is genuine and it comes with faith in Christ's atonement it will result in forgiveness it will result in conversion it will result in salvation it will result in eternal life and the such a conf confession must come from a broken heart I've not lived right. I've not done the right thing. But now I meet the Messiah and I meet Christ face to face. What a glory and what a gracious thing the Lord has bestowed upon me today. And then there'll be a willingness to forsake all sins and henceforth live by grace in godliness. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. We're reading from verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth a sinner, you know it, tell me, shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And you'll see here, it was real, it was genuine. And it says, it's my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against thee, thee only, have I sin and done this evil in thy sight. There was no excuse, there was no covering up that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me. You see, it's all personal. It's not like she made me do it. It's not like he made me go into that. It's not like I've been good all the time. Only at this time, I didn't know what came on me. No excuse at all. Purge me with Aesop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It's not like, it looks like I, I don't think I can overcome this thing. I can ever change because, you know, it's like this is my second nature. It's like I'm born with this. It's like uh, our people, this is how we all are. No, he said, make me here, uh, wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. And then he says, make me here joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice, hide thy face from my sins, and blot out, how many iniquities? All my iniquities. He was looking for instantaneous cleansing. He was looking for instantaneous salvation, instantaneous conversion, instantaneous transformation of life. He said, 
Lord, you can do it. You can make me as white as snow. You can even go beyond that and make me whiter than snow. And then you can give me a clean heart, create in me, verse 10, a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me, tell me. Uh, you know, even in the Old Testament, salvation came with joy. Forgiveness came with joy. Justification came with joy. It says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 13, everybody, one, two, three, go. Yes. Look at that. Verse 12, salvation. Verse 13, then, if you, when I have this salvation, well, the joy of salvation, I will go out and then I will tell people about the forgiveness of the Lord, about the grace of God, exactly what that woman did. Because she met the Lord Jesus Christ. Come see a man that told me everything I ever did is not this the Christ. And immediately after the conversion, then you can see a communication of the gospel. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. We'll come to point number three now. The immediate commitment of a converted soul. The immediate commitment of a converted soul. You are born again. I said you are born again. Okay, I didn't want to say the other way. Are you born again? That's why I said you are born again. So, are you born again? Of course, of course, you are born again. And now that you are born again, you must look for your neighbor. You must look for the men. You must look for the women. You must look for everybody around you immediately. The immediate commitment of a converted soul. We're coming back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 28. John chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said and saith unto the men come see a man who told me all things that ever i did is not this the christ then they went out and uh, out of the city and came unto him Look at all that happened over here. Number one, number one, I'm looking at verse 28. The woman then left her water pot. Left her water pot. She had something to leave. You see, when we're born again, we leave that and we come to this. We leave what used to be precious, what used to be important. What used to be part of our lives. Even some things that were not necessarily sinful. That were just part of us. We leave them because now there is a new joy. There's a new hope. There's a new excitement. She left her water pot. Who was there? Only Christ. And she left her water pot there. Why? You have nothing to draw with. Where are you going to get this water? Although she understood now is the water of life. Although she understood now is the living water. Although she knew now is a refreshing spiritual thing. All the same, she knew that Jesus Christ needed water. But she was so excited, she let the water pot, number one, for his use. For his use. You see, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not take a lot of badgering and convincing and, you know, talking and pushing and pulling and trying to tell you, do something for God. It comes naturally. She left the water pot, number one, for his use. Number two, she left that water pot in his care. We don't know whether she had others at home and this was she'll be using to draw water here but the excitement made her to just leave everything in the care of the lord jesus christ number three she left the water pot for greater service greater service drawing water here that's good that's all right that's necessary but it's a greater thing now that excites me 
There's a greater sin now that is pushing me. There's a greater sin now that I need to go into the city and doom. So, number one sin uh, that makes us to know that a change had come. The sin that she held on to before and the sin that she was not part with before, now she is parted with that and she left her water pot. Number two, look at that verse 28. And the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city went her way into the city why number one to reveal the long awaited hope because we know i know and some of our people know that messiah is coming when he's come he will tell us all things all of a sudden she discovered i've met the savior i've met the messiah i've met the christ the christ right here in front of me i must tell our people and so she went to reveal the long awaited hope number two she went to testify of her conversion she went to testify things are different now it's not like they used to be i met somebody who turned my life around i met somebody who changed my life Come and see him. He will do it for you as well. She went to testify of her conversion. Number three, she went to proclaim Christ. To proclaim Christ. She's been into conversation with men. Conversation uh, herself was a good conversationalist. Going from one topic to the other. From religion to natural things to the water to this and that. And now she has just one thing to talk about. And it is about Christ. She went so that she could proclaim Christ. Uh, let's come to verse 28. In verse 28... It says, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said unto the men, saith unto the men, this is number one now, without any commandment from Christ, without any commission from Christ. You see, she just discovered this is the Savior and this is the Christ. I that speak unto you, I am he. And without Jesus Christ saying, now go and tell other people, you must tell them this and compel them to come in. Just the realization and just the revelation that now I've made Jesus Christ the hope of the whole world without any commandment she went. And you see this? If she could go without any commandment, without any order, and without saying, this is what you must do, leave this, leave all these other things, and go and do this, without that, we have the commandment, we have the commission, we have the conversion, we have the, we say we have the consecration. Why then are we not doing it? Then, number two, she went at her own expense. She went at her own expense. You know, she didn't tell Jesus Christ and say, now that I've discovered you are the Christ, I've discovered you are the Messiah, I want to go and tell the people. But you know, since you are the Messiah, you must have the means whereby you can help make life easy and give me some transportation money and give me this and that so that I can go and tell them, no, she went without a command. She went at her own expense. Number three, she went in self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. Her needs, her family's needs. We need water. I must be careful. Jesus, help me keep that water pot. Jesus, I hope nothing happens to that water pot. I hope you can use your power and give me a new water pot. I think you can provide for me, or you can perform a miracle and expand that water pot. Nothing like that at all. She forgot herself. All she wanted now is for the people to hear about this Savior. And then she went, number four, putting herself down and lifting up Jesus Christ. Putting herself down. You know the person I have been. And you know my kind of life. And everybody, every one of you can tell how I've been living. But you know, I met him. And he told me every bad thing I ever did. And all those things, the things you could be ashamed of, he told me. But now he has forgiven me. He lifted up Jesus Christ while he 
uh, was uh, putting down herself. Number five, she went in the heat of the day. Remember, it was noon. Remember, the sun was up. Remember, these were the hottest time of the day. But all the same, with that heat and with the sweating and everything horribly, she went to tell the people, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Number one, she left her water pot. Number two, she went into the city. Number three, she went onto the, uh, she went uh, onto the city. Now number four, she went, she says unto the men. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 28 again. And the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and says unto the men, and says unto the men. What do we learn here? She had led men to sin. But now she felt a compulsion and she felt a commitment. The men I led into sin, I'm going to go to those same men and I'm going to lead them to the Savior. You see, that, that's a good thing that to think of your friends, to think of your colleagues, to think of the people you have met and they have influenced you to do bad things, so have influenced them to do bad things. And now the negative influence had been there. You are now going back to these same people and you now have a positive message, a positive influence. The people you led into sin before, you are now leading them to the Savior. Look at verse 39, the response of those people. And many of the Samaritans, uh, uh, many of the Samaritans uh, of that city, believed on him for the saying of the woman who testified he told me all that ever I did. Was she effective? Yes. You'll be effective so. Yes. Number five, look at uh, verse 29. Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Come, see a man. We told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Is not this the Christ? Number one, she was clear in her testimony. In, our, in her sharing, she was clear. Number two, she was concise. It's not a kind of a prolonged thing. Clear, concise. Number three, she was convincing. That's why all those men left the city for a man, for the men to leave. Not just one, not just two, but quite a number of them. She went everywhere she could. She knew this street and that avenue and that place. Come see a man that told me everything I ever did. It's not there is the Christ. It went like Jonah had only one sentence preaching. One sentence preaching. She too, she had just one test testimony. Come see a man who told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ she was clear she was concise and she was convincing number four she was compelling compelling that she it's the language the testimony compelled them and they came and then she was courageous think about a woman going to all those men think about a woman at a time when those men should concentrate on their daily work on their you know engagement and occupation and think about a woman like that going to disturb them and going to say come you must come you must come you know this one i never saw this in my life we've been waiting for the messiah we've been waiting for the christ i've seen the christ come see a man that told me everything that ever he did it's not this the christ she was was courageous she was consistent after she had you know gone this street and this street and this street and then she said I still must touch that place I must reach that place yes I must reach that to the consistently she was consistent and then number seven she was conclusive conclusive here is the conclusion of the whole matter I met him you need to meet him here is conclusion of the whole matter. He touched my life. He must touch your life. Come see a man that told me everything that I ever did. It's not this, the Christ. Look at uh, verse, uh, look at uh, verse uh, 13. Then uh, they went out of the city. Then they went out of the city. Why? Because our commitment, our conversation was number one, powerful. 
powerful. When she spoke and she said, come see a man that told me everything that ever I did, the spirit of God took back like an arrow and pierced their hearts. And they said, we must see what this woman is talking about. Powerful. Number two, believable. Believable. The way she spoke, we know her. We know her. This woman had never been passionate about righteousness, about holiness. This woman has never been passionate. If you want to talk to her about her, you know, life, she'll be dodging and dodging. But now see the way she's talking. This one is believable. And number three, it was pungent. Pungent. That the people just responded. And I'm praying that this kind of uh, power to convince people and bring people to Christ, it will come upon your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 30. Verse 30. And they, they, then they went out of the city and tell me the rest. They came unto him and came unto him. Look at that. Number one, no more coming unto her. No more coming unto her. You know, all those women, all those men rather, they were familiar with her. And whenever they wanted to practice whatever, they will go to her. But now, a change of life, and a change of direction, and a change of disposition, and a change of appearance. He, she was not attracting the people to herself. They came unto him. She was now attracting the people unto Jesus Christ. You'll attract people to Christ. Amen. Look at John chapter 8 verse 2. John chapter 8 verse 2. John chapter 8 verse 2. And early in the morning he came again. He came again into the temple. And look at this. And all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. You'll bring converts to Christ. Amen. Disciples to Christ. Learners unto Christ. Mark chapter 1 verse 45. Mark chapter 1 verse 45. But he went out and published and began to publish it much. And to blaze abroad the matter. In so much that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city. But was without in the desert places. And we're going to read this together. One, two, three, go. And they came to him from every quarter. Once again, and they came to him from every quarter. Say that again. God used uh, this uh, leper in Mark chapter 1 and uh, went to tell everybody, I was a leper, now I am clean. I was dirty, now I am whole. I was this, I was that, but now things have changed. And God used the woman on the other side over there in John. Come see a man that told me everything, all things, whatever I did. It's not this, the Christ. And they all came. It's now your turn. I said, it's now your turn. And you will talk to people and your talking and your testimony and your telling them will be effective in Jesus' name. See what this woman has done. Hold on now. There are people who spend years in a seminary and spend years in what they call Christian service. And they spend years coming for Saturday workers training. Tuesday, leaders' development, Congress, workers' retreat, and everything. And in a lifetime, they don't have this effect. But this woman, look at her, that she brought all these men. And she, as she brought them, the people testified. They said, now we believe. How many years have you known the Lord? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, more than that. What have you done? What have I done? What have we done? Why don't we then call upon the Lord and say, Lord, if this woman could do this, within this short time, and she had the passion, and she had the excitement, and she had the pungency, and went everywhere, the excitement, and then she labeled, she left everything, left her water pot, and then went and said, come see Christ, the Messiah, I met him, you must meet him, I transfer that power unto you. 
that excitement unto you that whatever it is that is dead inside you there will resurrect in Jesus name the fire will burn inside your soul and then the spirit of God will come upon your life and then the power to God you will not be tired you will not be weary and then you go to all the people and say come they will not resist your word they will come I said they will come who am I talking to there? Why don't you tell the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going out in your strength. I'm going out in your power. I'm excited about this. I'm happy about this. The joy of the Lord seizes my life. Even at this time, I'm going to leave my water pot. I'm going to leave everything. And I'm going to tell everybody I meet, come, come. Come see the Savior. He has saved me. Come see the Messiah. He came for me. Come see the Christ. He has changed my life. And it will change your life. Life to you. Your own time has come. Your time of fruitfulness. Your own time has come. Your own time of power. Your own time has come. Your time of preaching the word, proclaiming the word earnestly, faithfully, and effectively. You will be successful. You will succeed. Go and tell them and compel them to come in.